Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, so thank you for coming today to my talk. Uh, just very briefly about me. Uh, so I work with Django since 2007. I've been a, a Django core committer since 2011. And if you're ever interested in what I'm saying, you can um, always check out my uh, Twitter account. I work at Neuron. We are a web agency based in San Francisco and have offices uh, all around the world. And I encourage you to check out our website uh, if you'd like to see what we're up to. So about this talk. So this talk is about Django and React. And while it does assume that you know a little bit about React, I'm still going to cover some of the basic principles of Flux and React. And then I'll show some examples of how Django and React can work together. So first, about Flux. So Flux is an architecture uh, whose uh, core principle is based on a unidirectional data flow. Now, uh, that core principle principle is not particularly novel or groundbreaking. It's been used for a long time in many disciplines, like uh, video games, for example. And you may also argue that it's been used in the web in general with traditional websites. If you consider the traditional HTTP request, server-side template rendering response cycle over and over. But it is a, it is a bit new in the world of rich uh, uh, client-side web application. So let's see how it all works. Typically, it starts with uh, an action. An action may, is basically an event that is triggered by various things. It could be triggered by a, a user clicking on, on something on the, in, the user interface. It could be also a regular uh, event that is triggered at a regular interval by a timer. It could also be data being pushed via web sockets from a server. So whenever an action is triggered, that action is caught by a, a dispatcher, which would then pass that uh, action along to store. A store is just responsible for holding the state of your application. So when a, uh, the store may um, modify the, the state and the internal data and then pass that data over to the views. And then the view is responsible for rendering itself. It may also have subviews. So in that case, we pass along that data down to its subviews and then the subviews will render themselves and so on. So what's very important in this architecture is that whenever something changes, uh, needs to change in the state of your application, what you want to do is to trigger a new action. So for example, if a user will click somewhere on the interface, then you will trigger an action, a new action. And then that action would be caught by the dispatcher. And then you will enter this whole cycle again. You will then go through this entire cycle of re-rendering the, the entire interface. React itself is really just about this view system. It just fo focuses purely on rendering. Everything that sits outside, well, there are several implementations available out there. I can cite, for example, Redux, uh, Reflux, Flamox, Flexor, and uh, I don't know, Alt, Multi. There's about you know, a couple dozen extra. Uh, it's, it's still, you know, uh, Pretty new, there are no clear winners at this point, so it really comes down to uh, personal preference and to the nature of your application. Hopefully, within the next few months, there will be one or two that emerge as de facto standards, but for now, I just encourage you to try it a few and see what, which one feels the best. So let's see now what some of the advantages of Flux are. So first of all, it streamlines the rendering process. As we just saw, any time that anything happens that, would, that might impact the state of your application, you enter the, uh, the same entire uh, rendering process, which means that you will approach the, the, the rendering of your page initially uh, the first time the same way as on the second time, the third time, etc. And because of that, uh, it means that uh, your cognitive load is drastically reduced. Because uh, you, uh, you don't really need to worry about how the different views impact each other as the state of your application changes, you, you can really focus on uh, uh, one particular view at a time. Uh, that, that then makes uh, for uh, a simpler code base because you don't have to uh, deal with uh, mutations for your views. That eliminates a whole class of potential bugs that you basically never have to worry about. And that is very liberating. So all of that put together really makes for consistent, predictable behaviors, and that goes a long way in making you, as a developer, more confident about your application. Now let's see some advantages of React, specifically. 
So React abstracts the DOM with components. It allows you to think of the architecture of your application really in terms of uh, modules and submodules. And again, you can always focus on one uh, piece at a time. It also handles all of the DOM mutations automatically. Mutating the DOM is something that can be quite complex sometimes, especially in, uh, to do in an efficient way. Well, React will handle all that for you. And it, it is also agnostic about the rest of the stack. The only thing that React really cares about is that you feed it some data and then it will take care of all the rendering. It really doesn't matter in which context React is used. It could be used to render your entire application, but it can also be used to just render one little piece of, of an existing website, for example. And it also doesn't matter where the data came from, why the data changed, how it was changed, uh, which means that you can use, use it with pretty much any backend. And obviously, in our case, we'll be using Django. So to illustrate some, some of those concepts, I'm going to walk you through a small demo uh, app that I've built. It's very simple. It's just a list of photos. Uh, you may filter those photos based on whether it's black and white or uh, color. And you can also then select some of those photos to mark them as your favorites. But first, let's see what are the pieces involved. So first, we have Django, which will be responsible for providing a REST API that allows you to access and manipulate the data server-side. And then we'll have React that will be responsible for rendering the UI client side and to handle all the user interactions. Now let's see how those pieces fit together. So first we have the client, so that in this case it will be the browser. React will be rendering the page, and then whenever the user will click on, on the photos, a post request will be emitted to the server, to the API, and then Django will update the database. We then serialize the current state of the data and then pass it over to, uh, back to the client. And then React will be able to rerun the page uh, to reflect the, um, uh, the changes that have been made. And we try and follow this uh, unidirectional flow of data. Now you may be wondering, okay, so how does React do to render the page initially? How does it have access to the data to uh, hydrate the stores, meaning uh, to uh, load the stores with initial data. I'm going to cover a couple of different methods. One that you might think of as conventional is when the server will first return a uh, pretty much empty uh, document, HTML document, and then we'll do another AJAX request just to fetch the data so we can then render the content on that page. Another method which you might think of less conventional is when the server, so in this case Django, will serialize the data and stick the data into the initial HTML document and uh, pass it as a global JavaScript variable. And that is, for example, how uh, Instagram does it. So now let's take a look at a working demo. Okay, so can you all see? Make it a bit bigger. Right. So. So here we have our application. We have all our, of all our photos uh, to the left. You may filter the, the photos and uh, whether they are black and white or color. You can also represent the, the same list in two different ways. You can represent it here as a list or as a, as a grid of thumbnails. And uh, whenever you click on a photo, you will see that uh, first it will highlight the photo and it will also update the, the panel to the right which just lists all of the favorites that have been selected. So what's important to, uh, what I want to emphasize here is whenever I click on an event, or, or sorry, on a photo, whenever I click on any of those buttons, the entire uh, page gets refreshed. You, you, you can really see it because uh, React is really fast at doing that, but uh, any event here triggers a full page refresh. And you can see also here that whenever I click a photo, uh, it, it sends a request to the, um, to the server. Uh, so post request, delete request. All right, so now let's see how, wh what the code looks like. I'm going to start with the model. 
So it's uh, really simple stuff here. We, can you all see? Yeah, I'll make it a little bit bigger. So we only have two models here, a photo, which will hold just all, all of the photos. Each photo has a URL, also has a Boolean flag that will indicate whether it's a color or black and white. And then a f uh, another model, the favorite model, which will hold basically uh, uh, all of the pointers to the photos that have been favorited. Then the API. Uh, the API here was built with Django REST framework. If you're familiar with uh, Django REST framework, it should all look pretty standard. The only thing that I'm doing here that is uh, a little bit different is for the um, favorite endpoint when I add or remove a favorite. So for example, when I add a favorite, so that's the create method here, I will first do the, uh, the, the actual action of adding the favorite to the database. But then I will also serialize all of the current favorites and send that back with the response. And this is just a small optimization here that I'm doing, and I'll, I'll just explain why I'm doing this. And you can see here that I'm doing the same uh, for the destro method, which is called when you delete or remove a, a favorite. Okay, so then let's take a look at the view. The view is extremely simple. It's this one at the top, Ajax hydration. All it does really uh, is that it will run out this template and it's basically empty. There's nothing in there. We just have uh, the links to our JavaScript and CSS and uh, here I've just added a header. And as you can see here, initially we basically have absolutely nothing. So we do need to do that second Ajax request to uh, load the data. So that is done with this function here. So this function gets called as you first uh, display the page, uh, that empty page in the browser. So first we will render our React um, main view. So this render method here is going to get called. So the very first time that, that this is going to get called, the store is, it won't be hydrated. It will, there won't be any data at this point. So we will first display this progress bar. So this is what you can see here when I refresh the page. Okay. Um, then, uh, here I'm, I'm just waiting for a second. It's just to simulate uh, a slow, uh, slow connection to the internet. Um, but really what this, what this does is that it would then call this method fetch data Fetch data, uh, really all it does, it just runs uh, a couple Ajax calls. To, we, so we call our API, fetch that data, and once we receive all of it, then we are ready to hydrate the store. So we basically load that data into our store. At that point, our view is automatically going to be re-rendered. So this render method is going to get called again. And at that point, we, still, we are still displaying the progress bar. The progress bar is still displayed on the page. But at that point, the store has been hydrated, so we are going to render this instead, which is the album component. That's a custom component that I've made. And React will be smart enough to know that it needs to remove the progress bar and instead uh, dump our uh, uh, album component. By the way, you can see here that I'm using progress bar. That's just uh, a, a pre-made component that, I'm, that I've taken from the React Bootstrap uh, library, which is a, a React implementation of Bootstrap. But it kind of shows how you can build your application a bit like Lego pieces. So now let's drill down into our album, our album component. Again, very simple here. All that we do is to add two subcomponents. 
the photo panel, which is basically the grid of photos to the left, and the favorite panel, which is the, 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 the small uh, panel to the right that displays all of the favorites uh, that have been selected by the user. Uh, in each case, we also pass down some data. So the photo panel needs to know about the photos, so it can run out the photos, and also the favorites, so it knows how to highlight the different photos that have been favorited, and whereas the favorite panel only needs to know about the favorites. So here you can see that we're passing down data to the sub-views. Let's take a look at the photo panel. That's probably the most complex. Again, this random method is going to get called automatically at this point. First thing that we do here is to just filter the data set that we have based on those, I'm not sure why it's looking so big here because of the resolution. Yeah, okay, looks better like this. Okay, so it's going to look uh, for whatever is selected here to filter down and be, to know exactly what photos we need to, to display. And that's just a custom method here, just a little bit of JavaScript that's going to uh, go through the list and only return the photos that we actually want to display. All right, so now that we have uh, the list of the, uh, the photos to display, we then render some more components, some more subcomponents. Here, I'm going to call this uh, function here, render photos. It's just a uh, custom method that I have in here in, in this class, in this components class. All I do here is to loop through all the photos. Uh, I, com I do a little bit of computation. I, I try and f find out, for example, if the, photo, the current photo is favorited, so I can figure out what color, if I need to uh, display any highlighting around it. So that's the style here. And then based on what we've selected between the thumbnails here or the list option, we are going to take two different paths. So in this case, if we, are, if we have decided that we wanted to show as a thumbnail, then we're gonna render this, um, this particular photo as a thumbnail. That's another component that I've picked from the uh, React Bootstrap library. And then we assign the URL, et cetera, and the given style. Or if in the, at this point I have selected this piece, then uh, this, this function is going to get called and I run, I'm going to render it as a list group item component. Again, you can see here that there's absolutely no code that says remove the thumbnail, add the, the list items instead or vice versa. All I have to say, is I, I can code the, this component in a very declarative way. I can only focus on a given state and say this is how you should display it given this state or you display it this way given this state. All of the transitions here are basically handled by React because it's going to go through that method every time. And you can see here that I, I'm passing an action to, uh, to both methods here. So whether I click on a photo here or a list item here, the same action is going to be triggered. It's called toggle favorite. Now you can see what, uh, what is going to catch that action and uh, deal with it. So it's this method here. First, we try and figure out whether the current photo that's been clicked is a favorite. If it is, then we are going to remove it from our favorites. If it's not, then we are going to add it. So let's take a look, for example, at adding. And now here I'm going to do two things. And really, the, the, this first thing is not particularly React specific. It's more of an optimization for the user experience. Uh, I do not want to wait for the round trip to the server to be able to display feedback to the user that the, the, that photo has been uh, favorited. So what I'm doing here is that I'm holding a local data structure, which is basically an array uh, that holds all of the current favorites. And I will add that photo to that local data structure. And then I will call this uh, method here, propagate, propagate state, which is going to trigger a full render of the entire page, which is going to cause the, the photo you just clicked to already be highlighted. And this is because, uh, and th this is called an optimistic update, uh, is when you trust that the backend is most likely going to work and you just don't want to let the user wait too long before they see anything change on the interface. And then this is when we actually change the actual data server side. So for that, we need to run a post request to our API 
and I will pass down the photo. Then what I do here, and again, this, is, this piece uh, is optional. If you remember earlier, I said that whenever I run uh, an API call, I always return the, the current state of the data server side because this is really the, um, uh, the uh, authoritative data. This is the data that I really trust, the one that is st uh, staying on the server. I return that from the server so then I can replace my local data structure with uh, the data that was provided from the server. And here I'm only doing this just to give myself some extra confidence that the UI reflects the actual state of the data server side. If everything went well, really nothing is gonna change, but React is gonna be smart enough to figure that out. Because here I replace the, uh, the data that came back from the server, I replace it with, into the, the local store and then propagate the state. So that's going to trigger another full render. However, React is going to be smart enough to know that, okay, well, I had already made that chance previously I, was, I had already highlighted that photo, and I see that you're asking me to highlight that photo again, so I'm not gonna do anything. So this is not, this is gonna have very low impact on the performance. And this catch method here is if something ever went wrong on the server, then I'm going to fetch the data again from the server, and then that is also going to re-trigger a, a full uh, a render, and that's going to allow me to roll back. Uh, Previously, I had optimistically updated the interface, uh, but if something went wrong on, on the server, that's going to basically revert that change. And I do the same thing when I want to remove a server here, uh, a favorite here. I first optimistically remove that, that favorite from my local, my local storage, and then pro, uh, trigger full render, and then same thing, I send a request to the server and same thing again, I replaced the local data with the, new, the, the server, the, the, the data I came back from the server and re-render everything. So that was for the Ajax hydration that I mentioned earlier. There is another technique for the, uh, purely the initial rendering and that is this one. So, this is exactly the same demo. It looks and you know, works exactly the same. The only thing that changes here is that we are going to be calling this view, serialized hydration. So what we do here, we first serialize the data using the serializers from my API, the same ones. I then uh, dump it, all of that stuff into a JSON object and I pass that over to my template. And here we just dump that JSON object into the HTML inside um, a global variable. So this is here what you can see. If I show the source, you can see that's the object. So What's, what's good about this, what's interesting about this is that it saves you from doing an extra uh, uh, AJAX call. So it means that along with the initial HTML uh, document, you will already have the data. You'll be able to right away start rendering things. Now, you, you want to be cautious if you have a gigantic amount of data that might not be suitable because it's going to make the initial call uh, to the server slower. So you need to, uh, you need to find out what... Um, what method works best for you, either the Ajax hydration or the, that pre-serialized um, method. Okay, so that was for a, a brief demo. Uh, there, there's something else I wanted to talk about, which is server-side rendering. So server-side rendering may be interesting in different cases. First of all, if you're concerned about SEO, uh, Obviously, it would be much more easier uh, for search engines to uh, crawl your site and to index the content of your site if all of that good stuff, all that content was pre-rendered as, as part of the HTML document. Doing server-side rendering also, is also good for um, uh, if your audience uh, has a large amount of mobile devices. Uh, that it's also good because it will save some uh, resource uh, and CPU uh, processing on your, on your device because that will save them the effort of 
rendering the page initially um, inside the browser. And it's also good because uh, since the page comes pre-rendered, you can already start consuming it. You don't have to wait a, a little time for it to render. And React make that actually pretty easy to do. Uh, the cool thing about it is that, again, I mentioned earlier, React really doesn't care in which context it's being used. Uh, it means that you can actually use the exact same code to render things on the server as you would, and as I showed earlier, in the browser. And that is called universal JavaScript. Universal just stands for the fact that it's the actual same code that you use. That is sometimes also referred as isomorphic JavaScript. And it's actually easy to implement if you use the right tools. I recommend using Python React. It's a small nifty Python application that will allow you to do server-side rendering uh, with any Python frameworks. And it does come with um, uh, Django support. You will also need to use a very simple node HTTP server to do this. So let's see how all those pieces fit together. So first, <coughs> in the client, so that's our browser, when the, the, the user will first type in the URL to access your website, so there will be a get, a get request sent to the server. Django will then fetch uh, the data, serialize it uh, as JSON, and send that over via HTTP to that separate node server. That's, that node server, all that it does is just to render HTML. It will use the data that you provided and then use the, the, the React component, so those JavaScript React component, to render whatever component you want. And then it will return some HTML. Django will put that, all, all that together and send it over to the client. And past that point, any subsequent refresh that needs to happen will be done by React client-side, exactly the same way as I showed earlier. And the cool thing is that it will use exactly the same code, the same React components that I showed earlier. So let's take a look at a quick demo. So it is this function, this uh, URL here. Again, exactly the same, exactly the same thing. Uh, works and behaves the same. It's the exact same code, basically. Now let's see what happens server-side. So here, this is the view, the Django view that's going to get called. Here again, I first serialize the data using the same serializers from uh, my API. Uh, we then call this uh, small function. That's a function that's provided by Python React. All that you need to, to pass to that function is the uh, reference to the component that you want to render and then the data that you've just serialized. So in the background, that function is going to call uh, that separate node server, is going to send all that data to uh, that server via HTTP. That node server is also very simple. It's basically just a dozen line of code. It will receive the data passed from Django via HTTP that contains both uh, specification of which component to render and then with which data, and then call that React render function, which is going to use our, very, uh, same, uh, our same component that I, uh, I was showing earlier. And then you will, it will result into some HTML, which we are going to return back to Django. So this is where we are now. Now we have all of our rendered HTML and we are ready to pass it down to our Django template. And here we basically just output that HTML into our template. And you can see here that we have all of the HTML that has been pre-rendered. And past that point, the exact same React component uh, take it over from there and the, the, same, the same happens. Uh, it's exactly the same thing, okay? There's another couple topics I wanted to cover. First about asset pipelines. I personally recommend using something like Webpack, uh, Gulp and uh, Browser, or B Gulp and Browserify for uh, bundling all of your JavaScript code. Uh, up until about a year ago, I was using pretty heavily uh, Django pipelines and Django compressor to do that sort of stuff, but the tooling in the JavaScript world has uh, improved a lot in the past year. 
And now I think it's a bit more flexible to use those JavaScript tools to handle that stuff. And also, um, uh, front-end developers are already used to using those tools and they feel much more comfortable using those as opposed to more opaque tools like uh, Django Pipelines or Django Compressor. I also recommend using Babel for the JSX transpiling. A JSX is that uh, template-ish syntax that, um, that, that I was showing in um, uh, the code samples earlier uh, that Re React uses. And Babel will just transform that into actual JavaScript that your browser can execute. And then finally, when, when comes, the time comes to push code to production, then I recommend using Django static files uh, the uh, app and also um, the manifest study file storage, which will apply a unique hash to each of your assets, which will guarantee that all the caches in your browser, in the CDNs, etc., et will be busted and your uh, users will be using the, the very latest version of your assets. And finally, I uh, also wanted to talk a bit about testing. A good test suite should contain some unit tests, and for that you could use some JavaScript uh, frameworks like Jasmine, Mocha, Jest, QUnit. Also, I recommend doing some functional testing. For that, you can use something like Selenium and Django Dascom with some uh, support for that, uh, in particular with the LightServer test case. If you're interested in all that stuff, uh, you should stick around because there's gonna be a talk right after this that's gonna cover some of those topics. But I also wanted to cover one particular method, uh, which is sort of a hybrid between unit and integration testing. And that is actually using the same tools as I was describing uh, earlier about server-side rendering. Even if you don't really care about server-side rendering, you could use the same tools to do some amount of testing. I'm going to show you how that works. So here we have a very simple test case method. In the setup here, I just create a bunch, uh, a bunch of photos, photo one, two, and three, and I'm going to create some favorites. So just marking photo two and three as favorites. So then in the test method, I first serialize the favorites data, again using the same uh, serialize from my, uh, serializer from my API. Uh, we then call the same render component method from Python React. So what this is going to do is going to render our favorite panel component by uh, passing uh, the favorite data over to the node server uh, that's running in the background and then render that component. Again, here we're talking about this one to the, to the right and just, and just that component in this case. So then you, you basically retrieve all of the HTML that, that's been rendered for that component, and then you can basically test the content of that HTML. You could test, for example, which of the photos are present inside that HTML. So here I check that photo one, since it's not a favorite, I check that it's not in the HTML, and I check that photo two and three actually are. You may also use something like uh, a, a tool called PyQuery. It's a pretty nifty Python library which sort of mimics the, the API from jQuery, except in Python. That allows you to uh, select pieces of your HTML. So in this case, I'm, I'm selecting the div that has the badge class. So it's this thing here. And I just check that its text is two, since we only have two favorites in this case. And you may also use a method that comes with uh, Jan the Django testing framework, uh, assert HTML equal where you can compare two blocks of HTML. So here I'm, I'm uh, inspecting the HTML from the H4 tag, and that's this whole thing here, so favorites and the badge. And I'm checking that it actually is exactly that HTML. Now I don't recommend using this for huge amounts of HTML, but if you're uh, strategic about it, it can be pretty powerful because essentially we're here we're using uh, Python and Django to test JavaScript because the background, this is actual JavaScript that's been used to render that HTML. And that's about it for my talk. So thanks again for coming. Uh, I've published all the code. If you're interest, interested in checking that out and I also publish my slide later and I'm happy to try and answer some of your questions. Thank you.
great talk. Hi. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm curious if uh, you've explored good ways to integrate this with Django Forms at all. Django Forms? Yeah. Uh, forms, form sets, uh, uh -huh. or if, if this is geared more towards, you know, uh, application style or native style uh, web page rendering. Right, so I assume you're talking about uh, validating the data. I don't know, I, I have not. Uh, I don't see why you wouldn't. Some, but I guess, so at the end of the day, if, you, if you're going to use React to render your forms, you do want to use React components. So you cannot use just the output that the Django forms would give you. But there might be a way of turning that into, instead of rendering um, raw HTML, you could configure your forms to instead render React components. You could take that route. Otherwise, you you could just use the um, uh, you could still use the uh, the, the forms um, validating uh, process, but just hand over all of the rendering to React. Okay. I guess uh, the reason I bring it up is I've uh, I like the convenience of Django Forms, right? You can just set it all up and then render with as p or or mm -hmm. uh, anything like that. But then I've found it difficult to uh, construct uh, native style apps, uh, and so you know generally I would I would gravitate more towards this method if that's what I were trying to do. So I was just curious about you know what your experience was with that. Yeah. So again, I have not used Django Forms with this, but I believe you would have to sort of re-implement the the outputting of HTML from the Django Forms. So, and actually, that would be a cool project, actually. It'd be awesome if somebody wanted to take that on. And that's something I'll definitely look into. It's interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Hey there. Um, so I've been using uh, React lately, kind of similarly to how you're, um, you presented it here. Um, it's been really useful and it's been very fun. But the one thing that still makes me very uncomfortable is JSX. Oh, yeah. um, and it also makes the front-end developers that I work with very uncomfortable because they're used to working in something like handlebars, mm -hmm. for example. And so embedding, I mean, even having things like if you're specifying a class on a DOM component, it you use class name, you know, mm -hmm. the camel case attribute instead. Yeah. Um, is there any compelling reason to use JSX over trying to use one of the alternatives? Really, I think it comes down to personal preference. I personally actually really like it. And I know that the community is pretty divided about it. Some love it, some hate it. Uh, I, I, just, I just advise you just go with whatever works best for you. I, there's something you might be interested in looking into is React Templates. It's a library that, uh, it's basically an interface in between. So it will, uh, you will be able to write Templates that kind of look like uh, Angular templates, but will output JavaScript. Um, so it's basically a replacement for JSX. So you might, you might want to look into that. It will definitely look a lot more uh, familiar, and you'll be able to use the regular HTML-ish or, or attributes and tags. Um, do you think there's any downside to doing that, or is it really just personal preference? No downside that I can think of. Uh, at the end of the day, it's just it's basically just JavaScript. Uh, what I like about it is that it gives you a bit more power than you would have um, with templates, typically, because you have the, all the power of uh, JavaScript constructs and data structures and and uh, you know processing that you can use to your advantage to do cool things for looping through uh, lists and you know doing some kind of computation. So I, I personally like that, but I do uh, understand that it's a bit you know, off-putting for, you know, if you're really, if you feel more comfortable with just HTML-like syntax. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my question is, with a Django, um, you sort of, you're showing here that looks like Django effectively is being reduced to Django REST framework, purely serving the, 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 the API portions of what's going on. Um, and maybe some really, really light templating to put up the initial page that then React is doing all of the, the actual hard work here. Is, is this a question where Django's place in the world is just changing, or is there room for Django to interact better with these parts, or is there some 
intersection conglomerate that, of the two that we can use, preferably one that means I don't have to write JavaScript for a living? Um, <laughs> no, I, I don't think so at all. So uh, what I think is great with React is that it's great for doing really complex, dynamic sites that, you know, when you have lots of things that change all over the place, uh, but that's not all websites. Not all websites I li are like that. And so some websites are a bit more static and Django is perfect for those. Uh, you know, the traditional Django, not just the API side of Django. Uh, but you can then still use React to, to focus on the small bits uh, of your site that may be a little bit more dynamic. So I just see React as a complement uh, to, to you as a Django developer, no, totally not as a replacement for Django at all. It, it has to be used. React really shines when you have things that change, that are dynamic, but that doesn't mean that all websites need that. Or if they do, it, sometimes it's just a small portion of the site. And you can, in both cases, you can use React. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, thank you.